Welcome to the I Now Pronounce You Divorced podcast, where we have three award-winning family law attorneys dive into intriguing topics like divorce, military divorce, custody and visitation, trust and estate planning, and all things family law. Join us as we provide a comprehensive viewpoint through the eyes of our experts and guests aiming to educate and soothe our listeners. Get ready to tune in because I Now Pronounce You Divorced starts right now. Hi, I'm Charles Hatley. This is our podcast, I Now Pronounce You Divorce. This is Malone Hatley's podcast where we discuss weekly issues that we see our clients going through, issues that we know are important to you, and issues that we believe will help you through the, the divorce process, even if you just look at this information for a helpful input. Today, I'm joined by Dan Cuneo, and we're going to talk about an issue that we see arise all the time, and that is people ignoring the mental health aspect of divorce. You know, when you're going through divorce, there is a lot of moving parts, regardless of if you have children or not. You know, there, there's people whispering in your ear about their opinion of what you're doing. You have a relationship breaking down. You're having to worry about financial is, impacts of what you're doing. You may be having to talk to an attorney. You're going through a relatively tough time in your life. And, and I think people kind of gloss over how hard of a time this truly is. And, and they forget to take care of their own mental well-being. And what we have seen time and time again is that the clients we work with, when we can convince them, look, you, you need to take care of your mental well-being. You know, my advice is to go talk to a therapist. The ones that do that tend to get through this a little bit easier. So, Dan, I, I kind of wanted to talk to you. When you're talking to a client, how important is mental health to the divorce process? It's one of the most important aspects for, for several reasons. One of them being, and you, and you touched on it, is we want to make sure that the client is able to make clear and informed decisions. And if there's issues going on, whether it's just noise or whether there's something else that would make them not think clearly in the moment, because as you mentioned, divorce can be one of the most stressful, if not the most stressful times in your life and, and one of the events that you're going through. And, and it's hard to separate sometimes reality from fantasy, from emotions. And it just, it takes that mental drain or that mental toll on you. And sometimes you, you, you just check out and it's the job as lawyers or practitioners to make sure that our clients are well advised of what options are, what risk versus reward is, but also that they're able to make informed decisions. And as a practitioner, if we see that our client isn't necessarily actively involved or was involved and for now, for some reason, isn't, we have to ask those questions. Uh, it, it's it's imperative for, for many reasons. One, just again, saying we want to make sure that they understand what's going on. But then two, if there is something happening and we're not a, aware of it, the other side is going to pick up on it. And then it just morphs into some other issues that if you can head it off at the past or at least identify and figure out what is the the strategy on what we're going to do to try to help what the issue is, then it's either going to put you at an advantage or a disadvantage. So identifying in the beginning, if, if there are some mental health issues, you need to address it with the client. But if the client comes in and says, I have a mental health issue, then it's our duty to really flush that out and, and ask those tough questions. Well, what, what do you think you have? Or maybe they have been diagnosed and what are you diagnosed with and how does that affect you? And are you on any type of medication? What is that medicine? What is the dosage? How often do you have to take it? Are you compliant in taking it? Are there kids involved? How many children do you have? So there's all these questions that we just need to know. And, and it's a fact finding because that allows us to then determine, okay, here's what I have. Here's what I see the issues are. Here's what we need to do. And, and talking about mental health, you know, it, is such a, a touchy subject because for a certain people, they think talking about mental health is weakness. Talking about mental health is weakness. For other people, they, they, they can talk about it, but then they would say, look, if I ever have a mental health issue, that would be weakness. And, and you know, getting away from the, the subjective reality that most of us live in into more of an objective view of it is sometimes very difficult. And, you know, we always talk about we want to be your partner through this, this process. You know, we want to be your partner. We, we, and, and as a partner, we have to have tough conversations sometimes. And, and I've had that conversation with somebody who said, look, you know, uh, does your health insurance offer three or four free visits? Maybe just, just take it up on those three or four visits, uh, you know, just, just see how things are going to go. Uh, when you talk to somebody about that, 
Do you have any concerns that the information they disclose to a therapist is going to be used against them in the divorce process? Sometimes. And my hesitation is it, it depends. In the example that you were given, it, it's great advice because let's just flush it out. Maybe it's just anxiety that you're going through. And, and that can be easily, well, I should say, hopefully easily uh, corrected by just talking to somebody and talking it through and flushing that or getting on some medication that will help you through the process. Or another uh, option would be you talk to somebody and they do identify that there's an issue or or mental health concern, but that doesn't mean that it's the end of the game or that your case is going to take a, a turn for the worse. It's okay. Here's what I've been presented with as a potential diagnosis. And I say potential because you should get a second opinion, mm -hmm. but what do I need to do to improve? What do I need to do to make my, to make sure they're not jeopardizing or compromising any of my rights or interests in my case. And if it's done correctly, then that information that you're talking to with your therapist should remain confidential. If there are the only, there, there's very few times in a case that, to where I would have concern that that information is being disclosed to a therapist could come out through discovery. And that would be if there's potential harm to children involved, potential harm to yourself or to harm to someone else. But if you're just talking to a therapist because you need to talk to somebody, but you haven't been diagnosed with something that would prevent you from being around children, or you just you have a, a concern, but you're, you're just making sure that you're, you're bettering yourself and you're maintaining the status quo, which is keeping up with what the, the therapist is recommending, make sure you're current on your medication then I don't have any concern because what is the probative value? We like to, to use those fancy legal words, right? So if you're, they want to introduce that into evidence, and of course, as your practitioner, your attorney, we would object because it would be prejudicial. So then the burden would shift to the other side to say, well, the probative value would outweigh the, the prejudice. And, and I don't see many instances to where that probative value would outweigh the prejudice unless uh, those circumstances that I was just mentioning earlier would come into play. And if they would come into play, then we want to, to try to, to seal the court file and, and maybe have in-camera discussions with the court, mm -hmm. meaning we go into the judge's chambers and have discussions as far as what the evidence potentially is and, and see, okay, maybe some of it is relevant, some of it isn't uh, relevant, but what can we do as far as what is the big picture? What are we trying to accomplish here? Because if it's just to, to air dirty laundry or to make the other side look good, in my experience, and in the states that I'm licensed in, judges don't care, and, it, and they could sanction the other side for trying to do something like that. But if there's children involved or there's other potential issues that would relate to that mental health, then it is relevant, but for finite purposes. And it's always good to have those open discussions with the court to, to flush that out. You know, I was thinking as you were talking, we deal with a lot of individuals in the military who have suffered PTSD and, and they go and they get these diagnoses for PTSD. You know, some of them are getting the diagnoses for different reasons, right? For, for disability or, or for whatever. And during the divorce process, that will routinely come out. And, you know, the, the non-serving spouse will, and their attorney will really try hard to use that PTSD diagnosis against them, PTSD diagnosis against them. Um, and what I have seen is a, an evolution in the judges to look, like you said, more critically at it, rather than say, oh, PTSD, that means that you have these violent outbursts and you must be violent. Say, okay, then what is the diagnosis? Like, right, I, I do want to see the information, but what is it? How is it manifesting itself? And, you know, I was thinking about a, a case I had somewhat recently where they were really trying to attack dad for having PTSD. But, you know, the, the guardian lied him who was involved was like, I viewed this man as a child. There's no issues. The child was very loving of, of the individual. The doctor was very um, complimentary of him for handling his PTSD. And even the, the, the marriage counselor was like, we've never seen a violent outburst from this individual. And the other side would not let it go. And the judge ultimately sanctioned the other side for what they were doing because he determined that they were just doing it solely to embarrass this, uh, this individual who'd been enlisted in, in the armed services. Mm -hmm. You know, as we're going through this, what do you do with a client, you know, when you're working with a client who absolutely refuses to acknowledge there's any mental health issues that they need to address? I try to dig in because it, it's tough. And, and I try to put myself in the shoes of the client. They have mm -hmm. this uh, issue, concern, disease, 
And it's, it's a stigma in society a lot of times, and they feel embarrassed or ashamed. And, and it, it boils down to empathy. We need to really empathize with our clients. And, and that's, you know, you talked about partner earlier. That, that is the partner that you need. You need someone that, that can walk along the side of you and not always put on that lawyer hat. It, it's, it's the empathy hat. And, okay, I understand. Walk me through what you've been diagnosed with. How is it affecting you? And let them know that there's nothing to be ashamed of. Even if there are issues with it, let's, let's deal with it. But at the end of the day, you've been diagnosed with this. There's others out there in the world, right, that have been diagnosed. And in, in the PTSD, we would have a lot of children who don't have a mother or father if courts were to take the, the position, well, you have PTSD, so you're a harm to the child. Mm -hmm. and, but it's that, that, it's that stigma. It, it's what's just been presented in society because you have this, whether it's PTSD or any other mental health, that shouldn't, at least initially, prevent you from seeing your, your children. Now, there's, of course, extenuating circumstances when there are abuse, neglect, and things like that that come into play. Those are concerns that we have to flush out, but that might affect you spending time with your, your family. But in the initial meeting with the client or in the consult, you want to make sure that they feel comfortable, that they can trust you. And that, and that trust, it, it really it starts at that initial meeting. And then once you can get a better understanding of what the actual uh, diagnosis is, then you start creating that strategy and, and you're building that comfort, that trust with the client and letting them know that, okay, here's where I see some of the risk are and this is what we need to do. If they've just been diagnosed with something, let's get you into therapy so we can show that you're taking care of it, you're being proactive, you're, mm -hmm. it's been identified and this is what I'm doing moving forward. But if you have been diagnosed with something, then it's, okay, well, how long have you been diagnosed with it? And you've been married for how long? And there has been no issues. The police haven't been called. There's been no neglect, no abuse. And if there's uh, children involved, oh, your spouse leaves you alone with the kids. So it's a lot of times it, it's the sword and shield. And when you're going through uh, such an acrimonious situation as a divorce, what was it an issue during the, the relationship and during the marriage now becomes an issue. And it's digging into, okay, well, has there been these concerns before and how were they addressed? And, and a lot of times there, there really isn't. The other side is just using it to try to get an advantage when at the end of the day, so many individuals are diagnosed with some type of mental health that as long as they're being uh, proactive and they're compliant with whatever recommendations there are from therapists, doctors, and making sure they're uh, current on their medication, that goes a long way with the course and it goes a long way if there's any guardian ad litem appointed. It, it does, you know, and you talk about guardian ad litem, one of, of the pieces of advice I give most parents that come in is get your children to some sort of therapy through this process. You know, if they're young, maybe a play therapy, you know, something where they can just go and be around somebody else where, where they can talk and, you know, a little bit guided. Uh, and if they're older, maybe a, a true therapist where they have the opportunity to go talk to somebody in private and, you know, get away from their parents who are divorcing, right? If we get away from the acrimonious situation. The, the conversation I have, sometimes it, it, it's it's for a twofold purpose. One is we always want to make sure the children are healthy, right? You know, everything that we do is, you know, for the parents only, but it does have a, a bad effect on children sometimes. But two, when you talk to parents about their children, it gets them to view their children objectively, you know, view them from a more neutral standpoint than the subjective view that most of us have about ourselves. And then you can parlay that into a conversation of just like your children need somebody to talk to, you should go and, sure. you know, it, it get that and talk to somebody as well. So, you know, that's, you know, I, I don't like, it is always my advice to, to get the children help. How do you feel about that? You know, when, when you're advising people and somebody, do you advise people to get their children help? Do you think that that's somewhat overbearing? How, how do you feel about that? I, I, it depends on the situation, but most of them, it's great advice because at the end of the day, you want to make sure that your kids feel safe and feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes they the children may not feel comfortable saying, mom or dad, I really don't like you going through this divorce, or I don't like how you're, you're treating my mom or my dad. And they'll be more open with the therapist. And in those situations, it's better to try to figure something out earlier than to let it kind of build up in the child. And then you're creating a lot more issues and anxiety and stress for the, for the child. 
towards if you can get them into therapy early, then we can try to flush out what are these concerns that are going on. Because at the end of the day, courts are guided by what is in the best interest of the children. Hmm. And, and then the courts are going to look at, okay, well, who are the parents? And can we have frequent, meaningful contact between mom and dad? We wrote, in my experience, courts want the parents to be able to co-parent together. Hmm. And in and, and those unique circumstances where it's just not possible, then the court has to take a, a position and award, whether it's physical or legal or a combination of custody to one of the parents. But if we can try to work together and, and co-parent as in identifying that the child needs to talk to somebody, that's a, in my opinion, that's a huge step forward. And taking the advice that you just gave would definitely show to the court that you're looking out for the best interest of the child or the kids because you're encouraging them to go talk to somebody. And, and that can really just speak volumes as to the, the character of the parent, the intentions of the, of the parent, but also that our client is really wanting the best interest of the child. And so we're having that child go talk to somebody. And if the other parent is combative or doesn't agree, then maybe they are showing their true colors and their cards. And, and, and that might be you know, an advantage in air quotes, meaning because it really, that's not an advantage because it's at the disadvantage of the child, but it's mm -hmm. something that we want to be able to communicate to the judge to say, listen, we're trying judge. We are suggesting that the, the kids go see a therapist because we have these concerns, but the other side mm -hmm. is just either heads in the sand or just as being combative, just to be combative because we're on the opposite sides now. And I really want to make sure that my child is okay. And, mm -hmm. and, and in the, those it, times where that has happened, it, it usually benefits the parent who's encouraging the child to go into into therapy, but also shows that the other parent's trying to co-parent with the other one and wanting to have that open dialogue and communication. You know, you kind of you kind of took the next thing I was going to say is I always, even though we don't want to strategize using the children as a piece, when you're trying to do what's best interest for the children, like you said, sometimes the parent on the other side is instinctively just going to say no, because now you are adverse to each other. And you have parents that just say no to everything. And so if you're the person who's trying to get your children, even help that may seem not necessary at the time, but just giving them somebody to talk to, you have a judge, you have a guardian ad litem who's going to say, well, why wouldn't we do this? You know, it's, it's play therapy. It's, you know, therapy. And, you know, not all of our insurances cover full therapy for, for our children. And then you're saying, well, I'll pay for it. You know, I'll pay the copay. I'm not even asking the other parent to, to put anything in. Just agree. Mm -hmm. I'll drive them to therapy. I'll pay the copay. Just agree. And, you know, that carries a lot of weight in you when you're trying to decide what's in the best interest of the, of the child, especially in situations where the court is not able to do a, a more equal parenting time uh, uh, platform. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in thinking about uh, mental health, have you ever been in a situation where you question your client's mental health in, in relation to being able to agree to an agreement or, or, or testify? I have, unfortunately, and it's just, it goes with the territory, I think, for just practicing for a while. And, but you have to flush it out. And, and I say that because as we've been talking about, there are clients that are are combative because the other side is suggesting it. and i've had clients say well how can you agree to that because they're the ones that are suggesting it you must be for them and then you just have to you have to remember as a practitioner that it's not that person that's really kind of speaking it's the emotions that are speaking and sometimes it's hard because you can get wrapped up in it and excitement happens voices raise and you just gotta just remain calm cool and collected and remember that you're dealing with someone who's going through the worst experience in their life. And this is the emotions that are, are speaking through, but being able just to talk in a calm voice and let them know this is why it makes sense. It doesn't matter if it was your spouse that came up with it, the court or whomever, this is the best path forward and tied into what their goals are and hopefully educate or inculcate to them that this is why it makes sense. And they still may be a little bit more combative or, or angry and then just end the meeting and say, just think about it. We won't agree to anything. Hopefully cooler minds will prevail once, you know, you hang up the phone or leave the meeting and they're able to digest everything. But if they're still combative and they're still angry, then it's okay. Well, we have to flush out. Why are you still angry? 
And if you're seeing signs of anger management issues, or maybe you you know of a potential mental health diagnosis that they have, and, and this is, you know, we'll, we'll say flaring up, well, mm -hmm. now is the time to identify that and, and speak openly and, and reference back to whatever that issue is and say, you know, if this is the way that you're handling it with me, think of how the court's going to uh, view it. And if it's still uh, kind of escalating into combativeness and you're noticing different mannerisms with your client, advising that they probably should go talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. And you may have to terminate the relationship. That's a rare mm -hmm. uh, example and, and it is extreme, but if the client is just so angry and just so combative and just can't really understand and, and really want to move the case forward because they just want to do everything that is the opposite of what their spouse suggests, then it, it breaks down that representation and your ability to really zealously advocate for them. And you, you would have to withdraw, but it's not withdrawing and letting the court know all the issues that happened in the past. It's just uh, a conflict has arisen and I'm not able to fully represent my client. And, and and even in the rare instances, and I've only had this happen once in my 20 plus years of practicing to where I had advised a judge on what mm -hmm. the issue is because there was potential harm that might have been done to the other side. And that's a big caveat, right? We are, if there's harm that's going to be done to the other side, we, we have to say something, you know, we, we have to do what's right. Uh, but, you know, when, when you're trying to really be a partner with somebody, you know, Pure transparency is best. When you say, look, this is why I'm advising you this. You know, I get it. You think I'm siding with the other side. I'm telling you that the other side's setting you up. <laughs> this is what they're doing. Let me let me show you from their point of view. They're they're gonna set you up. And while we're we want to be combative in the right situations, we want to make sure that we're not being combative just for the purpose of being combative, right? You know, I, I always use the example, everybody wants you to be aggressive. And, and we, we tend to mistake aggression for, you know, running up to a wall and bashing your face through the wall to try to put a hole in the wall. Or I could use a drill. And so aggression properly pointed is much more useful, like using a drill to put a hole in the wall instead of my face where it hurts me. And, and so I always talk to people, you know, try to be as open as I can. And sometimes, like you said, no matter what I say to my client, they don't believe me. And in those situations, it's actually better for our client to go find somebody that they do believe and find somebody that they do trust to give them that, that, that perspective. You know, I want to thank you for joining me today to talk about what, you know, such an important issue. And, and that is mental health. You know, the divorce, like you said, is some of the toughest times that people will go through. And, and we need to acknowledge that we can seek help without retribution from the courts, without retribution from the other side and work through this process. You know, if you enjoyed the content today, subscribe to, to this podcast. You know, each week we, we come and we talk about things that we see our clients going through. We talk about concerns that we as practitioners have. And, and we talk about how we can really try our best to help people through this divorce process by, by looking at it as a partnership rather than an, an attorney-client relationship. So if you or someone you know is going through a divorce, give us a call and see how Malone Hatley PC can help you through this process. Thank you for tuning in to our podcast. If you found this episode helpful and you want more informational content, please be sure to subscribe and join us on all major social media platforms, including YouTube. Stay connected for more exciting updates and tips.